morning, and welcome to the Howie Diet webinar for August. It's hard to believe how um, how this year is already flying by. I had a hard time saying August there, almost said July. But we're excited that you're joining us this evening for the webinar on cool down inflammation with the spice of the century. And we're privileged to have with us this evening Dr. Siobhan Jackson Nicole, um, who's going to do a wonderful presentation. She did one for us. I believe earlier this year, and um, it was really great, and I know you're in for a real treat this evening. But before we get started, I'd like to open with a, with a couple of housekeeping things. Um, first off, feel free to ask questions through the presentation down in the chat window. Um, we'll go ahead and, and sort through those and feed them to Dr. Siobhan toward the end of the presentation and try to get to everybody's um, questions um, before the end of the call. Also, those that um, stay with us to the end, we'll be doing a drawing for three, for three people to have a three-month supply of our BCM95 biocurcumin, and uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit later as we go through the presentation as well. So hang in there with us, and um, you'll learn a lot and potentially even get a, a three-month supply of some incredible products. Before we get started, though, I'd like to open us in a word of prayer and um, just ask the Lord to, to bless our evening. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this um, opportunity to share some great information, Lord, and pray that you'll um, take cover over the, the technologies and uh, the presenter, Lord, and that the information will be will resonate with uh, the listeners and that everything will go smooth. We pray that we honor you in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I mentioned, we um, great to have Dr. Siobhan back with us. She graduated from the University of Bridgeport College of Naturopathic medicine. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Biomedical Engineering, and that complemented her training to become a naturopathic physician, and collectively paid the way to her teaching biological and, and clinic, clinical sciences at the university level. She was honored with the 2008 Clinical Excellency Scholarship and awarded its graduation. Her practice focused on wellness approaches to chronic disease with particular focus on disorders of metabolic and gynecologic origin. Dr. Shaban has worked diligently to create a healthy, scientifically balanced attitude toward the use of natural products. As medical ed educator for the Dilkus Biotech LLC, Dr. Shaban leads a scientific advisory team facilitating world-renowned researchers in the design, implementation, and practical dissemination of their investigations into clinically important and industry-esteemed process-patented phytochemicals. Dr. Siobhan, it's a great privilege to have you join us again, and um, we're excited to hear what you have to share tonight. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, Paul, for the warm introduction, and thank you everyone who has uh, already logged on and those who are on their way. Um, I want to just kind of get started very quickly this evening uh, with regards to this presentation as there's just a lot to go over uh, with uh, information and also what I have pinned uh, as the spice of the century. Uh, turmeric is a very, very, very interesting uh, spice. It's actually, um, in terms of research, there's over 9,000 research studies on turmeric. Uh, curcumin being the active ingredient in turmeric. Uh, there, it is considered the number one uh, most researched natural ingredient in the last three years, and um, it's only second to uh, the active in green tea, which is catechin, uh, in natural product research ever. So we are definitely talking about uh, the spice of the century. And um, if we can just start actually by talking about the burden of inflammation. So I really just wanted to initiate our time together by helping everyone to understand chronic inflammation and its effect on uh, the diseases that we see uh, among our family members, uh, even in our own lives, uh, among the uh, people that you guys share information with. Uh, it is pervasive, uh, chronic inflammation being the root of all types of disorders uh, of chronic origin, including neurological disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, uh, cardiovascular disease, including heart failure and strokes and heart attacks. Um, it's at the crux of metabolic disorders like diabetes and hyperten uh, hypertension, 
um, and metabolic syndrome, chronic pain disorders like fibromyalgia, uh, obviously things like cancer and chronic inflammatory diseases, uh, including IBD, uh, irritable bowel disease, or rheumatoid arthritis. So chronic inflammation is definitely something that we have to understand. Uh, some uh, sources note that it's about uh, 70% of all the chronic conditions that we are dealing with in today's time are caused by chronic inflammation. So before we begin to talk about chronic inflammation, I think it's very appropriate that we help, uh, I help you guys to just be able to differentiate the idea that first comes to mind when you think about inflammation. Uh, for most people, the type of inflammation that comes to mind uh, when they hear that word is, you know, the, the, the results of, say, twisting your ankle or the, the little waist uh, itchy area that might come from a bug bite. These are all types of, of what we call acute inflammation. Even the inflammation that comes as a result of a cold or flu, um, uh, you know, a, a sore throat, these are all types of inflammation that we know of as classic inflammation. They're also dubbed hot inflammation. And the reason why is because uh, this kind of hot uh, description is part of the cardinal signs of classic, uh, classical inflammation, which include redness, uh, swelling, heat or warmth in the area, pain or altered sensation like itching, and then loss of function. So you twist your ankle, there is loss of, of, of ability to ambulate or to move around. The ultimate thing you need to know about classic form of inflammation is that it's the body's natural response to a tissue injury or to an infection. Even babies are able to produce an inflammatory response. It's part of our innate immune system, the part of the immune system that we are all born with. You don't have to learn how to create inflammation. It comes as part of the package. However, that inflammation usually comes about in acute settings. So, again, you twist your ankle, there's some type of injury, the body will resolve itself to uh, uh, kind of heal you by causing you to lay off the area for a while, uh, to bring nutrients to the area, to move, uh, remove debris that's accumulated from uh, damaged cells. Uh, in the case of infection, the same type of idea. If the body's immune system is sufficient enough, it will, cause, it will kind of outdo the infectious uh, a stimulant or the infectious in inducer, and so it's self-limiting. Now, versus the chronic form of inflammation, this is what we kind of term or the literature terms as a cold type of inflammation or a silent type of inflammation or even a secret inflammation because it's insidious. Uh, you don't know that it's really happening because those cardinal signs are not there. It's considered a low-grade type of inflammation oftentimes. Uh, it can happen because of an infection that was never properly dealt with or some type of viral infection that the body is not quite able to identify or uh, quite able to uh, uh, surmount. Um, also things like diet, uh, stress, aging, um, and mostly uh, related to our time and, and related to a lot of what, what I see or have seen in practice, it has a lot to do with uh, obesity and insulin resistance. This type of inflammation has also been called meta, uh, M-E-T-A, inflammation because of the metabolic uh, dysregulation at its root. When it comes to obesity, there's been a couple areas that have been highlighted as to what leads to this type of inflammation. Uh, one of those areas has to do with what we call fat spillover. So as the fat cells kind of accumulate uh, droplets of fat, they get larger and larger, the mechanisms that would normally keep that fat inside are kind of over, overridden, and you get spillover of that fat outside of those fat cells. That spillover of fat has an uh, 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 impact on the way our metabolism works. It actually leads to insulin resistance. The other aspect of, of obesity has a lot to do with uh, the white blood cells that are associated with fat cells. As the fat cells accumulate more and more fat, they also accumulate more and more white blood cells. And it's these white blood cells that have the ability to produce a variety of chemical mediators or uh, signaling pathways that will actually lead to inflammation chemicals circulating around in the body. And so obesity, again, kind of lets on to this vicious cycle of insulin resistance, kind of continued uh, of fat accumulation, 
that fat accumulation leading to accumulated uh, 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 inflammatory signals. So in our next slide, the, uh, this kind of picture here was actually taken from a uh, study that was done by one of Australia's um, leading authorities on a chronic disease. His name is Dr. Gary Egger. And what he wanted to do, or what he was trying to do in this slide, is uh, he wanted to kind of find um, or uncover the modern-day equivalent to the germ theory. So the germ theory was very important in helping us understand acute inflammation as it pertains to infectious disease. Um, and he wanted to find what would be that kind of modern-day germ theory when it comes to chronic disease. So in this picture, it shows you on the leftmost side, you see acute uh, inflammatory response. And you can see that the arrow, um, the arrow itself, I'm just going to kind of follow it through with uh, this yellow, the arrow is kind of circuitous. So it's kind of going in this way where it resolves itself. So there's some kind of stimulant like a microbe or a pathogen like a virus or bacteria. That's the stimulus. That allows for this inflammatory response. Now, I want you to just take a look at the, the height of that fire, the intensity of that fire. That acute reaction is very strong. And then what happens is if the body is able to surmount that, uh, that stimulus, then the disease is resolved, okay? So with acute inflammation, again, you are dealing with a self-limiting process if the body is strong enough to do so. With chronic inflammation, which you see the arrow in red, the uh, germ theory equivalent uh, that he determined had to do with this um, kind of inorganic, unnatural inducer of chronic inflammation. He termed it as anthropogen, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But that's uh, generally the stimulator of, uh, of chronic disease, according to his theory. And what he found is that the body will, uh, as a result of this uh, this inorganic or unnatural stimulant, there's many things that can happen. You see this metabolic dysregulation. You see oxidative stress. You see insulin resistance. And all of those things kind of create this little vicious cycle, but that vicious cycle does not result in a very fiery inflammatory response. It's a low-grade inflammatory response that just continues to be perpetual um, and it continues to maintain the disease response. And so this, again, is just giving a visual of, of, uh, of that idea of uh, inflammation, chronic versus acute. So my next question to you is, if you look at this picture, um, and this has to be what you woke up to every day on your way to work, uh, the first question is, would you go to work? And the second question is, would you probably decide to walk? <laughs> because this is just... Uh, craziness. It's chaos. Um, I don't know where I got this picture from, but I, I wouldn't want to live near there. Uh, my question to you, though, is what is the likelihood of this chaos resolving itself? And it probably wouldn't take you very long to answer that question. Uh, it probably would not resolve on its own. And the thing is, is that chronic inflammation is very similar. You have all of these cars and buses, each with their own agenda, they each have wherever they're trying to go. Nobody is willing to let the other person go. And oftentimes a situation like this will need some type of external control, uh, some type of police, or you may need traffic signals to be installed or, you know, traffic lights to control this type of chaos. And with chronic inflammation, uh, you do need an external control in order to limit the response. So the same way that we saw all of these cars and trucks and buses coming from different directions, I've kind of simulated the same thing here with these various uh, uh, signaling pathways that are induced with uh, chronic inflammation. So uh, most people are familiar with COX-2. COX-2 is one of the inflammatory pathways that we know things like uh, aspirin and ibuprofen uh, deal with. Uh, some other factors that are uh, chemical pathways that are stimulated by those white blood cells that I told you are, are accumulating in, um, in fat cells are things like NF-kappa B and tumor necrosis factor, uh, interleukin-6, uh, even CRP, which is a very common test that's done uh, for people in order to know if there's a level of uh, chronic 
low-grade inflammation going on in the body. Uh, CRP is another one of those pathways. But what you can see here is that there's these various pathways synonymous to those cars and trucks and buses, each with their own uh, agenda, trying to get where they need to go. And they're all releasing their respective chemicals, which are inflammatory. The result of that dynamic, that active state, uh, is chronic inflammation. And it's a perpetual response. Okay, it's a response that requires external control, as you can see down at the bottom I just highlighted. So in, uh, let's see, 2000 and I believe this was 2004, uh, Time Magazine released this cover story, which uh, some of you may have seen. And this was... Uh, a, the cover story was the secret killer. And I told you that was the, one of the ways of describing chronic inflammation as the secret or, or silent killer or cold inflammation. Um, and you can see the fire that it expresses in that, uh, that picture of the body. And the subtitle is The Surprising Link Between Inflammation and Heart Attack, Cancer, Alzheimer's, and Other Diseases and What You Can Do to Fight It. So 2004 was kind of the first time that this whole idea became mainstream. And still, um, it, it, it's something that's spoken about in research and, and uh, as a medical professional, it, it's understood, but it hasn't transformed how we do things. It hasn't transformed even the layperson's understanding of uh, lifestyle, diet, um, uh, the anthropogens that uh, may be in their lives, and also how to deal with that. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a healthy uh, way. So uh, this Dr. Egger, the same one that I was speaking about from Australia, uh, in his, in his uh, article, he tried to hypothesize where did all this chronic inflammation come from? Uh, where did all of these chronic diseases come from? And what he did is he kind of took this uh, uh, ret uh, retrospective perspective. He he did a timeline from the pre-Neolithic period all the way to present day, uh, post-Green Revolution. And he looked at the things that were in our diet and in our lifestyle uh, early on, and then he looked at the things that have only been in our lifestyle as of the last 200 years. So you can see he was able to separate those things that have been part of our uh, makeup, if you will, a part of our lifestyle, uh, into anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory. And so at the top, you can see here, anti-inflammatory, I'm highlighting, and at the bottom, you can see pro-inflammatory things. So many of the anti-inflammatory things have actually been with us since the very early days of our existence. Uh, breast milk, um, uh, uh, let's see, a meat that is a very low in saturated fat or monounsaturated fatty acids, fish, fiber, um, a low uh, energy intake uh, to energy expenditure ratio, meaning how much are you consuming versus how much are you burning in terms of physical activity, uh, our, our level of physical activity. Uh, what I've highlighted here in this circle, which is uh, intake of fruits and vegetables, things like nuts, seeds, and soy, uh, and then the balance of good fats to bad fats in our diet, that's uh, omega-6 and uh, omega three. Also, uh, alcohol, which came a little bit later, it's still to a degree, uh, even the literature still suggests that in moderation, has anti-inflammatory benefits. Um, uh, olive oil, cocoa, uh, herbs and teas, all of these things still characterize as anti-inflammatory, all of them being uh, very early on in the human existence. Now, you look past the uh, Industrial Revolution. This is only 200 years uh, before now. BP is before present. And you can see the things that have come along as part of our uh, develop, uh, development or uh, industrialism, uh, things like smoking, uh, air pollution, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals, saturated fatty acid meat, um, this high intake but very low uh, expenditure ratio, inactivity, sleep deprivation, chronic stress, obesity, all of these things he has termed anthropogenic. Again, those anthropogens being defined as man-made environments and the byproducts, the behaviors and or lifestyles associated with that man-made environment. 
And right now, we have a lot that we have created. We have lots of benefits, technology, the ability to, I don't know where all you guys are, but for me to talk to you from New Jersey. Uh, technology is all good, but it, all, it also has come with a lot, of, uh, a lot of other things as well. So I want you to keep your eye on um, those anti-inflammatory uh, nuts, seeds, fruits, and vegetables. We're going to stay there for a moment. So phytochemicals, which are found in uh, your nuts and seeds, your fruits and vegetables, your plant-based, uh, they're plant-based chemicals. That's what the term phytochemicals means. These are absolutely non-negotiable. They've been with us since the beginning of time, and you can see as the man-made environments have come in, they have also dropped off. Our intake of them has decreased. Um, the group of phytochemicals that research has shown has been the most beneficial uh, for human existence has been polyphenols. A very large group of, of uh, chemicals, uh, curcumin, which is the active ingredient in turmeric, is a polyphenol. The catechins, which are part of green tea, also polyphenol. So very, very, very uh, big area. Um, these are more important now than ever before. That's my conclusion. Because we are living in a post-industrial, pro-inflammatory world. Okay, so again, all those anthropogens, which were not there 200 years ago, we are dealing with them now. And so the need of, for increased intake of fruits and vegetables to kind of contend with that inflammation is very important. So under here, I have a study that was done in the American Journal of uh, Clinical Nutrition in 2005. And what they did is they had people take, uh, over the course of eight weeks, uh, uh, different uh, intakes of fruits and vegetables. So they had a low intake in one group of 21 people, two vegetables per day. Uh, in another group, they had people take uh, uh, five servings of fruits and vegetables per day. Uh, and in the third group of 21 people, they had them taken uh, eight servings of fruits and vegetables per day. What they did is they looked at CRP. Remember, CRP was one of those chemicals, uh, inflammatory signals that I mentioned to you that is often checked even on blood work, uh, particularly related to cardiovascular disease and uh, overall inflammation. And so they looked at this CRP measurement, and they wanted to see what happened over the eight weeks. So they took a baseline value before the study began, and then they took a, a, a value at the eight-week uh, endpoint of the study. And so down here you can see the groups. Uh, the group that took in two, the group that took in five, the group that took in eight. This little asterisk that I have here signifies the group that had significance. And when it comes to study, significance is important because all they study here was uh, three groups of 20 people. Now, how you extrapolate that to the whole population has to do with significance. Well, the people who consumed only two fruits and vegetables, they did not uh, reduce their CRP by any significant uh, amount. The people who consumed five fruits and vegetables, the CRP level or overall chronic inflammation uh, signal did come down a little bit, but not enough to uh, extrapolate to the entire population. Only the people that consumed a serving of eight fruits and vegetables per day were the ones to reduce their inflammation significantly by measure of this CRP. So there's something to this whole fruits and vegetables thing. There's something to this idea of polyphenol. So polyphenols, this is just another slide to show you. Polyphenols in the form of olives or olive oil, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, uh, grapes, and even red wine uh, from those grapes have a variety of pathways that they are using um, in order to decrease inflammation, okay? So inhibition of COP, regulation of NF-kappa B. These are all the same signaling pathways that I've mentioned to you before. And then those things help to balance out uh, inflammatory signals in the body, thereby decreasing cancer, uh, onset, and also uh, inflammation, okay? So the question is, um, I call the fruits and vegetables the forgotten food group, uh, especially in America. Um, the median daily vegetable intake among adults in the United States was uh, kind of scaled in terms of these uh, uh, green variations state by state. And so I'm here in uh, New Jersey, right over here, and we are consuming on average 1.6 uh, vegetables per day. 
And even if you put California or New Hampshire or Oregon, who are in the darkest green color, they're consuming greater than 1.8. So on average, most Americans are taking in two vegetables per day. Remember, when we looked at our groups from that study uh, in the American Journal of uh, Clinical Nutrition, the groups that consume two uh, fruits and vegetables per day were not decreasing their CRP levels by any uh, significant amount. Only those that got to the level of eight fruits and vegetables per day were doing, uh, putting a dent in inflammation. So is the average person getting enough to make a difference? And the answer is no. So turmeric, the spice of the century. I gave you guys reasons of why I call this the spice of the century, um, but just a little bit of information about the actual ingredient itself. So the Latin name is curcuma longa. It's a staple dietary spice in India, uh, Peru, uh, Indonesia, um, other Southeast Asian countries, uh, China. Um, it's usually consumed in the Indian diet at about two to four grams per day. It's been in, used in uh, traditional medicine, uh, medical systems like uh, traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine for at least 2,500 years. Uh, its anecdotal use is for a wide variety of conditions. And even the way that it's being studied now um, in present time is for a wide variety of conditions. Uh, India, we know when we've done retrospective studies or what we call epidemiological studies, that India has the lowest rates of chronic diseases in the world, uh, colon cancer, prostate cancer, Alzheimer's disease, lower there than in any other place really in the world. Um, and so there must be something to their diet, and this is how we kind of all came to identifying turmeric as that magic uh, ingredient. The active constituents in turmeric are the curcuminoids. Uh, curcuminoids are a group of three uh, uh, analogs or kind of very similar molecules. Uh, curcumin is the predominant one, and they all collectively are polyphenols. The same polyphenols that are in fruits and vegetables, they're in that same family. Uh, there's also tumorones, which are volatile oils or essential oils. And the product BCM95 that's in the uh, new generation of uh, curcumin has essential oils, and that's kind of what makes it unique. Um, there's overall 230 uh, in, uh, constituents um, found in turmeric. So it's a very diverse uh, molecule, but the group called curcuminoids, which are your polyphenols, and the volatile oils are the two groups that uh, have gotten the most attention. All right, so turmeric uh, curcumin is what we call the complete anti-inflammatory. And this slide was supposed to have a little bit of an animation to it, uh, which would help you understand that curcumin kind of puts a stop to inflammation. It is that external uh, change agent, if you will. It is that external uh, modulator that really targets every last one of, of those um, uh, inflammatory signaling pathways that you see here. It's been studied for every last one of them. It works on every last one of them and the vari uh, variable uh, chemicals, inflammatory chemicals that it release, releases. So uh, below there it says curcumin polices all of these pathways. Uh, it subdues inflammation from many different angles. Another interesting thing about uh, curcumin is that it is the solution to what I call a one-sided anti-inflammatory. So all of us at some point in our lives have used an anti-inflammatory. Maybe it's aspirin, maybe it's an ibuprofen, or uh, maybe it's been a steroid for a particular uh, a rash, something topical, or even a steroid for an internal chronic use. Um, there are even uh, uh, drugs like celecoxib, which is a specific COX-2 inhibitor. Um, someone we know or ourselves have at some point in time used an anti-inflammatory. Uh, but many of these are what we call one-sided. So I'm going to just try my best to kind of highlight these things. It's a little bit, go a lot going on in this slide. But we'll start up here with tissue injury. So remember, an infection or tissue injury um, can be the cause of inflammation, even acute inflammation. Uh, the tissue injury will lead to um, the cells, the membrane that surrounds the cells, releasing uh, some of their cellular components. Um, the, the components that make up those cell membranes 
uh, some of which can be what are what's called arachidonic acid. All right. Now, what makes up the cell membranes is very important. It's very diet dependent. If the diet is full of saturated fats, you're going to have a lot more of this inflammatory arachidonic acid as a starting uh, ingredient. If the diet is filled with a lot more fruits and vegetables, uh, good uh, good fats from like flax and uh, fish and um, uh, you know, nuts and seeds, then you're going to have more anti-inflammatory uh, types of fats as your starting ingredient. But arachidonic acid will be there. Arachidonic acid will go down uh, a couple pathways. So you have this pathway I'm highlighting, COX-1. You also have another pathway, COX-2. And you have a third pathway called LOX pathway in the blue. Now, COX-1 and COX-2 are generally triggered at the same time. A COX-1 pathway is actually very protective. It's what is uh, required for the, um, the repair of the, the lining of the stomach. COX-2 is what releases inflammatory signals, okay, called prostaglandin. It is what signals pain. It is what signals inflammation. So when we have a tissue injury, uh, mostly COX-2 is going to be uh, 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 activated. Now, what happens is, we take something like uh, aspirin. Aspirin is a type of NSAID or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or Aleve or ibuprofen. And Aleve, ibuprofen, and aspirin, they tackle both the COX-1 and COX-2 pathways. So they shut down pain by inhibiting both of those pathways. Now, it's kind of a side effect to inhibit COX-1, and that's why associated with the chronic use of NSAIDs, is gastric distress or ulcers in the stomach because they're really trying to target uh, COX-2, but they're not very sensitive or specific. So COX-1 gets inhibited as well. Um, after that, pharmaceutical companies came up with more specific COX-2 inhibitors, which also reduce pain and they decrease swelling, but they are very specific. You can see here in the purple, they only target COX-2. But some of them have come along with uh, their own side effects, which are even more detrimental, like uh, heart uh, issues. Now, either one of those pathways with chronic use of NSAIDs or COX inhibitors, COX-2 inhibitors, what they leave is this LOX pathway unattended. And over time, what studies have shown is that the body will react by causing the LOX pathway to become even more intensified. Now, the LOX pathway is also dealing with pain, but it also deals with uh, constriction of the respiratory, uh, respiratory um, uh, airways, all right? So it's, it's very uh, important for asthma. But this LOX pathway, if it's not properly attuned or dealt with, it will increase and it will lead to these drugs being what we call one-sided. They will not get fully rid of inflammation. They may just deal with pain, but inflammation can still be low-lying. Curcumin is what we call the solution to those one-sided anti-inflammatories. They deal with the entire pathway. So they deal with a COX-1 by modulating it. It does not cause ulcers or, or things of that nature, irritation. But it does decrease pain uh, by both this LOX pathway and COX-2 pathway. It additionally acts a little bit higher up, uh, right after the cells have been broken down. Uh, this is where uh, we see PLA2. Uh, this is uh, phospholipase. This is where steroids act, higher up. So curcumin has the ability to be very, very uh, 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 powerful like a steroid, but it is also very balancing in terms of its anti-inflammatory effect. Okay, so not only is it a great at uh, decreasing inflammation, but it also has anti-inflammatory benefits as well. So the subject of, the, of this presentation so far has been about decreasing pro-inflammatory pathways, uh, but it also has a benefit in increasing something called interleukin-2, which is a powerful anti-inflammatory. So it's very targetable and very inducible. Um, it's powerful just like uh, steroids uh, without the side effects, and it also um, has uh, its use in inflammation that is uh, two-sided versus one-sided. The other aspect, as I mentioned to you, with chronic inflammation has a lot to do with uh, the production of, of, of free radicals or what we call oxidative stress. And so I asked the question here, what do a rotting apple and most chronic inflammatory diseases have in common? And the answer is oxidative stress. 
So this apple is rotting after it's been cut because it's exposed to air and it's exposed to oxygen, and that oxygen is reacting to the various cells of that apple. So reactive oxygen uh, species, which we term ROS for short, are unstable, and they try to find stability by attacking stable structures, uh, membranes around cells, proteins within cells, and even our cellular blue, uh, blueprint, which is our DNA. They are also the cause of most chronic diseases. So 33% of deaths, uh, uh, oxidative stress is believed to contribute to, and it's linked to 40% of total medical costs. So oxidative stress is very, very important. Now, when you think about oxidative stress and free radicals, you need to understand that one is, uh, is uh, something that is kind of, how can you say, normal to an extent. Free radicals are normal to an extent. As I said, you know, you set an apple out here on your table, it is going to brown uh, in a very short period of time because there are uh, oxygen uh, species that are in just the environment. Um, nitrogen also causes uh, free radicals as well, certain nitrogen species. They range in strength. Some of them are slightly, you know, on the benign side, and some of them are very, very detrimental. Um, they can be environmentally introduced. And if antioxidants are available, they can be maintained. But oxidative stress, on the other hand, uh, is defined as a disturbance and a balance between the production of free radicals and the defenses, which we call antioxidants. So oxidative stress is a kind of uh, surmounting problem. If you don't have enough antioxidants there, uh, free radicals will uh, accumulate, and then that will create uh, overall damage. So I have a picture here of the egg and the chicken, and they're arguing because uh, there's a line. And so uh, the egg says to the chicken says to the egg, "No, you back off. I was here before you." And so this kind of goes back to that old. Uh, argument, which came first, the chicken or, or the egg, when it comes to inflammational oxidative stress. We know that they're hand in hand, and we are, we're not really sure which one came first. It is debatable, but the overall consensus is in order for a molecule to be a powerful anti-inflammatory, it should also be an antioxidant. And in order to be a powerful antioxidant, a molecule should also be an anti-inflammatory. So it doesn't matter really which one came first. It matters that, that those two functions exist within whatever that molecule is that you're talking about. And curcumin uniquely provides the best of both worlds. It is a powerful antioxidant. It is a powerful anti-inflammatory. So antioxidants, in terms of free radicals and oxidative stress, they are our saving grace. Uh, the body produces uh, antioxidant enzymes inherently, but we also take in uh, antioxidants in our diet. Uh, oftentimes, the in antioxidants that we're taking in are on a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. So say uh, vitamin E will be able to neutralize one or a couple uh, free radicals. But curcumin being such a powerful uh, antioxidant, not only is direct acting in this one-to-one -one ratio, but it also is preventive because it deals with the inflammation that might be uh, underneath it, and it also is synergizing, and I will kind of just talk about that very quickly. There is something called NRF2 activator. Um, this is essentially the mother of all antioxidants. Um, it triggers something called the antioxidant response element. And uh, this is the master regulator of all antioxidants present in a man. And uh, by being such a powerful uh, uh, antioxidant uh, kind of response element, it does everything from limiting inflammation, enhancing detoxification, limiting fibrosis. And so curcumin not only acts like a vitamin E or a vitamin A in this kind of direct direct one-on-one uh, -on -one neutralization, but it then goes to the, uh, the, the core of the cell and it activates this uh, antioxidant response element so that you trigger uh, even the internal uh, and inherent enzyme systems that deal with free radicals and oxidative stress. With aging and with uh, chronic uh, disease, the ability to activate that AR system is going to be diminished, the ability to activate it naturally. So curcumin can do that as, a, as an outside source as an outside activator of uh, NRS2. So to close up, 
the question might be, can I just eat more curry, you know, just like uh, what's native in the Indian diet? Can I just sprinkle more turmeric and put it in my smoothies or, or what have you? And, and the answer is yes, uh, but there's a big but after it. Uh, if you look to your left-hand side, you can see just a, a picture to kind of put it in perspective. Curry powder would be this larger circle, okay, because there's other ingredients in curry powder, including like uh, uh, cumin and um, uh, probably some, um, uh, some other spices, I don't remember, coriander, are all part of cur uh, curry powder. The turmeric portion is this darker uh, circle within the larger curry powder circle. And the curcumin is this little tiny thing down here in the red. So it's very small. Curcumin uh, in turmeric spice is about 2%. And in overall curry powder is just a very small fraction. Even when you take turmeric itself, most of it is unabsorbed. Most of the curcumin is unabsorbed. The majority of the curcumin is excreted via the feces. Uh, a lot of it is acted upon by gut enzymes right in your intestine lining. Uh, a lot of whatever curcumin does make it past the intestine, uh, intestinal lining is very small even in the blood. And then what makes it in the blood in a larger amount is the bound-up form, the less active form that relies on the body's ability to convert it to the active form. So BCM95 is an ingredient that is 100% turmeric derived. There's nothing else in BCM95 except for the uh, uh, curcuminoids, which I told you are a collection of three molecules that look very similar called curcumin, uh, uh, demethoxycurcumin, and bis-demethoxycurcumin. And then uh, turmeric oils, or what we call tumorones. These are essential oils that come directly from the turmeric rhizome. Um, we have fully integrated sourcing and manufacturing. I speak, um, you know, the, the uh, manufacturers are in uh, Kerala, India. Um, we kind of know everything that's happening as far as, uh, you know, their sourcing and things of that nature. It doesn't have any binders, fillers, excipients, no bio enhancers. It has a 13-year track history record for safety, uh, no issues there. Um, it has a unique curcumin and uh, turmeric oil synergism. So the curcumin has its own benefits. The tumorones have their own benefits. And there have been studies to show that the two of them together are better than either of them apart um, individually. Uh, the bioavailability of this curcumin is seven to nine, seven to ten times more bioavailable than just having curcumin as a spice or turmeric as a spice uh, or turmeric even as a capsule. And it's been clinically verified. So it's backed by uh, 15 completed clinical trials for various conditions, uh, as well as 10 ongoing trials. So that is what is found in this uh, Hallelujah Acres New Generation Biocurcumin. Uh, the dosage is, uh, I believe, 400 milligrams, and 86% of that is uh, uh, curcuminoid. So that is, uh, hopefully, I have um, uh, given you guys a little bit of a clearer perspective of what inflammation is, acute versus chronic and how that chronic inflammation really plays into chronic disease, and then how this spice, this just, you know, uh, really uh, kind of inconspicuous spice that's been used for generations and generations uh, can be a powerful anti-inflammatory for uh, today's condition. So thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you, Dr. Siobhan. That was uh, excellent. Such, such great information and so in-depth, and thank you so much for sharing it. We've got a number of um, questions, and we'll take just a few of them here. There's a couple of themes that I wanted to go ahead and, and um, kind of highlight for you, though. Um, one relates to um, people having indigestion when they take um, curcumin and turmeric, and they're questioning mm -hmm. whether DCM95 would have the same kind of um, impact on somebody with IBS or Crohn's or other digestive issues. Uh, what, that's a very good question. It's a question that we actually uh, get um, asked a lot. Now, for, for people who are not used to spices in general, um, the Indian diet is very uh, rich in, in terms of spices that they use, and turmeric is a, is a, is a spice. It's a very uh, intense spice, actually. And so, uh, yes, with BCF-95, it has, uh, in some people, 
uh, created just a little bit of even, you know, agita or a little bit of uh, even reflux sometimes. And so our suggestion is uh, that they start off very uh, low dose. So if uh, what they're trying to take is, is two, gra- uh, two capsules per day uh, per the recommendation on the bottle, that they just start with one capsule. Um, curcumin always uh, was taken in the context of food. So taking it on an empty stomach is not something that's recommended, not only for absorption purposes, but also because just the nature of the spice itself. So it should be taken uh, with a heavy meal. Also, uh, if fat is part of that meal, it will also help with the digestion. Now, when it comes to IVD and IVS, interestingly, uh, curcumin is studied and has been found to be useful as an anti-inflammatory in those diseases. So sometimes people just have to get over the hurdle of their body kind of getting used to uh, taking this intense spice, uh, which you can do, again, by starting at a very low dose, making sure you take it with the heaviest meal of the day. Um, And and generally that will kind of uh, uh, do the trick for most people. And and should everybody take... Um, a BCM95 um, biocurcumin, or how would they know that they need it? You know, everybody's dealing with inflammation. So, you know, and then mm-hmm. is there a therapeutic type, is there a therapeutic regimen that somebody might want to follow? Okay, so uh, another great question. Um, our, the studies that have been done on BCM95 have all been, uh, for the most part, have been done on the one gram dose. And that has been for uh, a variety of conditions. So uh, for the new generation uh, curcumin at 400 milligrams, that's just, you know, uh, shy of uh, two capsules. It's just shy of that one gram. Um, We have uh, uh, even studied it in in terms of what would be the maximum dose. So we, we don't suggest people going you know, too, too high, like uh, four grams, I think, is the kind of highest limit that you really want to push with DCM95. Um, but definitely what we have studied uh, and what has proven benefit in a variety of conditions has been at a one-gram dose. Uh, because most people are dealing with inflammation on some level, um, even uh, taking that one-gram dose daily could be beneficial, but also uh, taking... A lesser dose, myself, I take just one capsule. I don't have any uh, diseases that I'm concerned with, but the fact that it's a powerful antioxidant uh, in and of itself, that's important. The the fact that it has uh, benefits in terms of regulating insulin, uh, that it's a great detoxifier. So I take it for just general health without uh, having a particular condition associated with it. And I take just more what I would consider like a maintenance dose. Uh, which is a one capsule per day. That makes sense, and, and that's really helpful. Um, we've, we've been on for, for quite a while. Is there any last comments you'd, um, you'd like to share before we wrap it up for the evening? No, I, I think that's all. I mean, the, the questions, um, you know, especially related to if everyone should take it, you know, I really highlighted the importance of diet, and I know that's fundamental to the Hallelujah Acres lifestyle. Um, the inclusion of fruits and vegetables uh, as kind of the mainstay of the diet. All of those things are polyphenols, but again, uh, looking at what we're up against in terms of our environment, that's one of the reasons why curcumin could be an adjunct, even for those with the best of diets. That's great. Well, thank you so much again for joining us this evening. It was a pleasure having you, and like always, we learned so much from you. You're just such a wealth of knowledge. Thank you for, for joining us tonight. Thank you for your time. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Before we go, we do want to announce our winners. Um, we have uh, Carmen Mehta, um, Martha Weaver, and Sheila Rose. You are our lucky winners this evening. You'll each receive a three-month supply of the um, Highly Diet bio Kirkman. Until next month, we um, hope to tr- trust you stay well and in good health, and look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you. Have a good night.